Hi and welcome to another edition of Lessons Learned. This is a hopefully a quick video that is a both a response and an expansion to what two other fellow YouTubers have been doing uh, today, which is talking about embargoes and games that are being released with a lot of bugs. I'm um, talking about uh, Rich from Review Tech USA. The link will be below, and of course uh, the one and only uh, John Total Biscuit Bane. From when now on, I will re uh, refer to this to him as just as Mr. Bane because I don't know him personally. So this idea that I'm gonna just call him Total Biscuit or something sounds a bit uh, too much. And uh, I refer to Rich as Rich because I don't know his last name, so I can't call him Mr. Something other. So now that we got that out of the way, uh, let's talk about uh, these broken games. So specifically, we talk about news about how Assassin's Creed Unity came out and it was a mess. Uh, and there'd be also been problems with the remaster editions of Halo 1 and 2, you know, the, the Master Chief edition. Um, both of them uh, required uh, day one patches and had uh, problems, in the case of Halo, uh, trying to get matches uh, in the multiplayer, which is the bulk of what Halo players do, which is play on, on multiplayer. And in the case of uh, Assassin's Creed, it's a single player experience, like the story experience. Uh, and both of these have been very broken. In the case of Assassin's Creed, there was a delay of the embargo post-launch. I believe it was between 6 to 12 hours, according to uh, Mr. Bain's reporting. Um, that is problematic. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm going to focus on what uh, Mr. Bain said. Uh, he talked about the industry, and he talked about a, a few things. And I agree with most, if not all, of his conclusions. The difference is the route or the route I take to reach the similar conclusions as he does. He talks about the embargo, how uh, things are manipulated by some companies to perhaps hide uh, problems with games, etc. But I think it's something deeper and it's something that is uh, an ongoing problem uh, across the industry. Not just Ubisoft, not uh, Microsoft Games or 343 or any one company, but a pattern that has been going on really for now a couple of years, if not a decade. It has two parts. Uh, the first part is what, I, what a lot of people call the hype train. The idea that uh, you put a lot of hype behind a game. And now that, that very hype train is uh, exiting the station earlier and earlier. I think the average now, if you go by uh, presentation at E3, uh, is about a year and three months. That is, a game is first announced with a teaser trailer on one year, say 2011, E3, and then a whole year passes, and then you have the actual announcement of when the game is going to be released at 2012, right? And then that game, if it's a big AAA title, gets released that fall, usually around this time, November. That, you know, it based about, about a year and two months, a year and three months. Um, but all the while, you see a lot of news and rumors and teaser trailers and cinematic trailers and character reveals and a lot of tweets trying to create a sense of hype as soon as possible, as early as possible, and as often as possible to maintain that hype train going down the rail until the time of launch. And the reason you want to do that, the reason why the hype train is so important, especially with AAA companies, is because it creates what I like to call the impulse to buy. Video games are not driven by, uh, you know, b dedicated research. They are entertainment. And like a movie or a good TV show, if you see something cool, you're like, oh, I want to see that. I want to buy the DVD. I want to own the game. It's that, Im that almost instant feeling of instantaneous uh, impulse to get the, the, the product as soon as possible. And the hype train is designed to create and feed that emotion for as, and sustain it for as long as possible. The throw money at the problem, throw money at the screen meme you see you know, from Futurama. It's like, you know, here's my money, right? Take my money now. I want this now, right? And it's a good marketing sense. If people want to buy the product, if you can create that sense, there's a guarantee that you're going to buy that that uh, product and it's going to be a, a great success and seeing that the uh, video game industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and we have several titles that are at the billion dollar mark and gross and net uh, gains uh, but it's also a very tumultuous industry 
you want to get as in as early as possible and sustain that emotion for as long as possible to guarantee those sales. That's okay by itself. A little exploitative, perhaps uh, a little too much, from and, and starting a little too early, but is understandable. The problem is when you go from that to the actual release of the game, the actual marketing of the game, and how it's being sold. Because games are now suffering with what I call the patching culture. Uh, or should I say, there's a patching culture around the actual product. And what is the patching culture? Well, patches and bug fixes have been around since the beginning of computing, right? They have always been seen as uh, fixes and, and logical after sales service. Something is wrong with the product, the developer, the manufacturer has a responsibility to fix those things. You pay your money and you expect a quality product in return, at least something that functions. Right, it may not. It may suffer from other circumstances. The story might be poor. The the gameplay might be, you know, passe. It might not be very interesting, etc. But at least you want the product to work when installed, when put on the tray on the on the console, or it used to be, you know, slammed the the cassette in, right? And that was the expectation, especially back in the day with consoles, but even with PC. You know, you bought the game, you bought the disc, it was a floppy or a CD-ROM. Uh, or you bought a Catrick and you put it in and you it, it worked. Whether the game was good or not was it, in other areas, it was supposed to work. In fact, Nintendo even put a seal of approval, right? These are the games that Nintendo Entertainment of America and Nintendo Entertainment of, of Japan guaranteed that it would work, right? Uh, and consoles have had relatively high standards when it comes to basic functionality. It ha they have to because of how games are been, were distributed and still are distributed. The physical... Uh, distribution chain demands they have some modicum of quality. Otherwise, you can have end up with you know a landfill full of cartridges, right? A lot of people get dissatisfied very quickly, return the games. The you know the the, the companies of uh, the are the sellers of GameStop or used to be uh, or the mom and pop uh, uh, sellers or Walmart whatever are left with overstock they're not going to order anymore so that means that all those discs all those boxes all those cartridges are going to be you know back in the warehouse and you're not going to move the product and getting returns and doing all that with a physical product is problematic is hard work and above all else it's expensive and it has hurt a lot of companies in the past but something happened probably in the mid to late 80 and 90s uh, and into the 2000s when you started having PCs almost always connected to the internet. First, using, um, excuse me, um, dial-up, and then later off, uh, various forms of broadband, cable, and all that. When that happened, it was possible to send any fixes of, to, of a game or a product down the line, right? You know, Windows, uh, Microsoft could send upgrades, security upgrades and all that, to Windows constantly to the consumer. They didn't have to buy a new disk or go to the store and get one over the mail. Uh, games like World of Warcraft could you know, install, constantly revise the, uh, their model, their persistent world, and do upgrades. And so it became part of PC culture to have these upgrades uh, available, both for um, multiplayer games as well as single player games. And so we got used to that. But consoles, for the most part, seemed immune to that because they were not necessarily connected to the internet until the last generation, where uh, the bulk of 360s and uh, even um, PlayStation 3s were connected to their own dedicated uh, internet services. And when that started happening, the manufacturers, developers of games, say, oh, we can also send um, bug fixes and patches through these services as well. Uh, especially for digital downloads, and that, and DLC became more popular, etc. The infrastructure was there, and so now the patching culture has infected consoles. What I mean by infected? Well, because I I mean that somewhere along the line, you had a transition from, like I said, uh, well-meaning uh, after-sale service to the idea somehow that you can sell an incomplete product. Uh, to your to the to the customer and they will accept it because you can promise as an implied promise of a fix 
coming down the line in, in minutes, hours, or days afterwards. And uh, the patching culture not only affects the idea of you know patches on games and make the games workable at some point in the future, but also I think it has also encouraged things like season passes and encouraged things like uh, the pre-orders, the idea that you can sell the idea of the game. You're not selling an actual product, you're selling the idea of the game. And people who are revved up in the idea of the impulse to get this product as soon as possible, because they have to buy, 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 I have to have the product now, 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 are willing to do almost anything, within reason, hopefully, uh, to get the product. They're gonna pre-order, they're gonna also pre-order things like season passes. Once they get the product, they'll uh, go into uh, microtransactions because they're so into the game, they want to have the best in the game. In fact, microtransactions are now seen as done not by people who have little time to play the game, but in fact, people who are most invested in the game. Uh, and that means that you have basically the, the gamer on a hook, right? Uh, and when you have these two trends, you have the hype train colliding with the patching culture, you end up with situations like this. Uh, time and time again, um, games that are incomplete, they're broken, unserviceable, and the reason why it happens is, 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 is from the consumer point of view. Now, Mr. Bain talks about the consumer being patient, right? Waiting. And I think that's great advice. You have to wait, right? Don't pre-order, especially in the digital age. You're not going to run away. Uh, companies are not, not going to run away. Uh, obviously, they can crash and burn. Uh, and they're institutions, so they have no legs. So running away, hopefully, it's impossible for them. It, uh, corporate executives, on the other hand, will run away from almost anything, if given a chance. Uh, companies uh, are not going to run out of digital stock, right? Unless a server crashes and stuff like that, but there's no physical copy there. Um, there is the idea that, uh, you know, they, they want to sell the product, and the product will be there. So you can wait, wait for reviews, wait not for previews or cinematic trailers, wait for actual reviews. Don't look at the numbers because numbers are useless. Look at what the reviewer is saying. And if the reviewer is making a, he or she is making a well thought out argument pro or, or con or different points of the game, you know, in favor of buying the game or against buying the game, read it and see what is going on. Way to have less players who now are, get their hands on games as soon as possible and put them on YouTube. You can see the game being played much better than a demo, right? You can have some spoilers, of course, going on, but for the most part, if you see, let's say, I don't know, the first five to ten minutes of the game, that gives you a good idea of what you're getting into. And if there are any bugs, there's a good chance that many a Let's Player will tell you, you know what, I had, you know, I had these problems loading up this game. Or recording this they have a lot of problems and these are the problems right they might not be reviewing the product but their reaction to what's going on especially if it's a sort of a um, you know first impressions kind of situation like mr. Bain does in a WTF series then you know that's a good thing to watch as well if you hear any news about embargoes being delayed that's another clue that there's something out there to hide I would also say that even though Many an indie dev uh, needs the financial support to get their games finished and they go to um, Steam's early access. That, I think, is another uh, aspect of the patching culture. The idea that you can put a game that is clearly unfinished out there and people will pay good money for it. You know, they'll pay money just to have access. They want to have the game so badly, they want to have the experience as early as possible, and they don't want to be spoiled by something else, they just want to have it now, they're willing to pay for an unfinished game, right? So whether it's early access, whether it's paying for, uh, you know, season passes, whether it's paying for microtransactions, whether it's waiting for mods or patches, you are, as a consumer, you have to be both patient in acquiring the product, not after acquiring the product, you know, say like, you know, I can wait a day or two before I make this buy decision, buying decision. Make informed decisions whenever possible, and don't put up with it. So simply don't put up with it. If you see a company doing this too much, you know, say, you know what, I'm gonna, 
I'm gonna, next time I'm gonna wait. You know, if you see Ubisoft doing this time and time again, you're like, you know what? Uh, I mean, I'm giving you a benefit of the doubt before, but I seen you doing this a couple of times. EA or whatever, right? And we've seen this with many products as well. Uh, the only way you, to end the patching culture is, first of all, get off the hype train. And second is just a, a, a slight delay, you know, from buying, from just rushing to buy. And say, you know what, I'm going to buy this product eventually. But what before, but not before I know, you know, word of mouth, my friends, Let's Players, etc. I seen something that tells me, okay, this is a, a, a game worth buying. Because now, of course, they're also pushing the kind of formula, again, with season passes, with DLC, with a, a deluxe editions, that nearly double or even triple the price of the game. I've seen some games sold for as much as $180 with all the feelies and stuff like that. So, you know, I would be very careful in a situation like that. It was like somebody saying, hey, you know, you gotta buy, you gotta buy, you gotta buy, you gotta buy. It's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'm not in a rush. I can wait 24 hours. I know it sounds impossible, but I can do that. Um, it also behooves a lot of the gaming media not to participate in the hype train. You know, a lot of gaming news is just uh, rumors. Oh, you know, there's a rumor that this game might be out at some time in the future. And when you start cataloging the dates of those rumors and when I, you know, ideas are floated to the gaming media and press releases, I seen them as early as three years before actual release. Here's the thing. I would say, and this is a ballpark number, any announcement, any news about any product 90 days before release is absolutely worthless. You know why? Because literally, they do not have a game to sell you. There is literally no product. A lot of the product is made in a rush in the last 90 days before release. That's why you end up with these huge uh, multi-gigabyte patches because there's a rush to deliver the product as soon as possible. So a lot of things are cramming those last three to six months. Everything before has been basically working out the sort of basic parameters. Some games are more complete earlier than others, but that's no guarantee. Most of the time, the bulk of the work is going to be done right at the end, right? And that means that anything before that, it's unreliable. Demos are unreliable, just like what happened with uh, uh, Aliens vs. Marines. Uh, that, that was a demo that was a complete and other lie, right? Um, you saw what happened in Battlefield 4 and the bugs. We've now seen it with Unity. We've seen it with, Math, uh, with Halo. You have to be careful. And also extends as well to PC as well and console because now even consoles are constantly going through the process of being updated uh you know with firmware upgrades like what do you need all these firmware upgrades for when you just i just need the machine to play the game that is on the disc or i just downloaded you know it used to be perfectly fine i remember having my xbox oc i call it oc for origin original console you can't call it the one because well you know uh it was there, and I even when it was co constantly connected to the internet because I, I was on uh, Xbox Live back then, I never had not a single uh, firmware upgrade. The, at no point did Microsoft sell, you know what, we have to upgrade the OS on this machine. Let's wait a couple, maybe you wait a couple of hours between game sessions for you to upgrade this thing. You don't need it. It's not needed. It is time to retire the patching culture. And I think once gamers start behaving like consumers, which is hard to do because everything around us wants to, uh, you know, make us be the rabid gamer that always wants the new newest thing now, now, now. And that's not exclusive to video games. There's a lot of things. It can be media and other things as well. Once we come, we realize that we don't have to succumb to the impulse to buy, that the power is in our wallets. I think. And we say, you know what, I'm willing to wait. I'm willing not to pre-order. I'm willing to find out what's going on before uh, committing to this product. Because that's the thing, the uh, impulse to buy leads you to put money down, right, on, say, on a pre-order. And now that the emotional investment leads you to a financial investment, the money down, which then leads you back to an emotional investment. Well, I already put money down, so 
I want my product because I already paid for it because I was excited for it and it's a it's a deadly cycle right so the only way we can defeat this if you will is by uh, just being a little patient just waiting a little bit and not buying into the hype you don't have to boycott companies you don't have to put nasty comments and in, in YouTube videos saying oh you people are buying into the hype I hate you you are the problem no you don't have to do that you say you know what as an individual I'm gonna wait and I'm willing to wait I'm willing to wait for a dry spot I'm willing to wait for a steam sale I'm willing to wait do that and I think the the slight changes in the grass will lead the developers to go like um okay uh, you know we're not getting as many pre-orders that we want to we're not getting what we want maybe we have to modify the way we're doing things it's not going to completely disappear you're still going to have patches you know but it's still going to be useful to you as opposed to be detrimental to your experience well that's all for now uh hope you enjoyed this video as always please comment and subscribe and i'll have links to all the people i mentioned before including a, an article uh by polygon on weaponizing embargoes below thank you for listening and watching and i'll see you when i see you good night